Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. This issue, we delve into the Nobel Prize winning author Ernest Hemingway's breakthrough work, The Sun Also Rises. While this novel marked Hemingway's rise to fame, it encapsulates the distinctive traits that defined his entire career, such as his restrained and understated narrative style. The Sun Also Rises features two men and one woman as its main characters, with a central plot following these three individuals and their group of friends as they travel from Paris to Spain to attend the Running of the Bulls Festival. To better understand this novel, we must first explore the background of Hemingway himself and the Paris of the 1920s, as the story is heavily based on his own experiences during that time. Ernest Hemingway, born in 1899 in the suburbs of Chicago, Illinois, was the second of six children in his family. During his youth, Hemingway enjoyed a carefree life, excelled academically, shared fishing and hunting adventures with his father, had a deep love for music, and displayed innate talent in writing. In 1918, at the age of 19, Hemingway embarked on a journey to Europe to participate in World War I as a journalist, but ended up serving as an ambulance driver for the Italian Red Cross. During a rescue mission, he was accidentally injured, and doctors removed over 200 pieces of shrapnel from his body. Post-war, Hemingway struggled with physical and mental wounds, frequently experiencing insomnia and unable to sleep with the lights off. During the first half of the 1920s, Hemingway lived in Paris, working as a journalist and writing novels. He described this period of his life in Paris as very poor and very happy. Paris after the war attracted a multitude of ambitious and anxious writers and artists, including figures like Gertrude Stein, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the author of The Great Gatsby, T.S. Eliot, Salvador Dali, Pablo Picasso, and many others. They, along with Hemingway, created an elegant, wild, and refined artistic and social circle in the city. Hemingway's later work, A Movable Feast, provides detailed descriptions of this Parisian literary scene. In 1926, Hemingway completed The Sun Also Rises in just six weeks and subsequently edited and published it. This book marked his emergence in the literary world. The experiences of the book's main characters closely resembled those of Hemingway himself and other young individuals who had served in World War I, depicting how the war had left these once vibrant and strong young people feeling disillusioned and morally adrift. After reading the novel, Gertrude Stein famously referred to Hemingway's generation as the lost generation, a phrase that Hemingway incorporated into the text of the novel itself, becoming a symbol for the generation of young people who had experienced the horrors of the war. Hemingway continued to gain recognition, and in 1929, a farewell to arms further solidified his reputation. Throughout the 1930s and 1940s, Hemingway was deeply involved in adventures and hunting and made multiple visits to war zones in various capacities. In 1932, he wrote one of his finest short stories, The Snows of Kilimanjaro, and in 1940, he produced For Whom the Bell Tolls, set against the backdrop of the Spanish Civil War. In 1952, The Old Man and the Sea was published, and two years later, Hemingway was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature although he did not personally attend the ceremony. In 1961, suffering from physical and mental health issues, Hemingway tragically took his own life by placing a double-barreled shotgun in his mouth and pulling the trigger. After introducing the author and the background of his work, let's now step into The Sun Also Rises Together. The story begins with the recollections of the protagonist, a journalist named Jake. Jake has an American friend named Cohen, who comes from a wealthy Jewish family and was once the middleweight boxing champion at Princeton University. However, Cohen didn't actually enjoy boxing. During his time at college, Princeton had a strong anti-Semitic atmosphere, and to prove himself and defend his dignity, he started practicing boxing. As he continued to train, he eventually became the champion. After graduating from college, Cohen quickly got married but soon squandered the $50,000 inheritance his father left him. Just as he was contemplating whether to leave his wife, she decided to leave him first, which had a significant emotional impact on him. Besides, this five-year marriage left him with three children. After the divorce, Cohen moved to the literary scene on the west coast of the United States 
invested in an unsuccessful literary magazine, and ended up with a lover. After the magazine failed, Cohen and his lover came to Paris, where they stayed for three years. With the financial support of his mother, Cohen lived comfortably in Paris, where he wrote novels, played bridge, practiced boxing, and made friends in the artistic community, including Jake. The story truly begins one afternoon in spring. On this day, Cohen goes to Jake's office to ask him to accompany him on a trip to South America, hoping to have some romantic adventures along the way. Hemingway's characters engage in dialogue that is quite distinctive. It consists of direct quotations without much description or commentary. This writing style is not only concise but also allows readers to intuitively understand the characters' personalities through their words, forming their judgments without relying on the author's opinions. The conversation between Cohen and Jake reveals that they have opposing views on many aspects. For example, Cohen dislikes Paris and detests the Latin Quarter where students gather, while Jake feels right at home there. Jake enjoys bullfighting and dreams of hunting in Africa but Cohen has no interest in these pursuits. However, the fundamental difference between the two lies in Cohen's sense of the fleeting nature of life, his desire to enjoy it to the fullest, even if it means seeking some meaning in life through hedonism, while Jake fundamentally denies the existence of meaning. In the evening, Jake, Cohen, and his lover all went to a dance club together. There, they encountered the female protagonist, Brett, a charming, hedonistic, and somewhat vain woman. How does Hemingway portray Brett's character? He relies on subtle descriptions that reveal just enough. For instance, he suggests Brett's association with a group of homosexual men by depicting her as unconcerned with traditional moral values and having blurred gender consciousness. When this group of homosexual men enters the club, the police officer at the door gives Jake a meaningful smile. It's worth noting that back in the 1920s, figures like Alan Turing, the father of artificial intelligence, were convicted of homosexuality in the 1950s and ultimately met tragic ends, but the police in 1920s Paris appear rather lenient by merely smiling. This handling of detail exemplifies Hemingway's narrative style. He referred to it as the iceberg theory, which involves restraint and leaving the majority of the story hidden beneath the surface, with only about one-eighth visible above the water. This approach contrasts starkly with the ornate and heavily descriptive language found in traditional novels, as it took the unruly hair off literature with unheard of courage. Returning to the story, Brett's appearance immediately captures Cohen's attention, and he spends the entire evening gazing at her in a trance. However, Jake and Brett leave first, leading to the question of whether they are very close. Indeed, they share a deep affection for each other, but their relationship is not romantic. Jake and Brett met during World War I when Jake was hospitalized due to an injury, and Brett happened to be a volunteer nurse with the ambulance corps. Their relationship gradually evolved from there, but they never ended up together. Before the war had even ended, Brett married someone else. However, what prevents Brett and Jake from being together isn't a cliché third-party interference. It's Jake's loss of sexual function due to his wartime injury. From wartime Italy to post-war Paris, Jake and Brett maintain a state of wanting to love each other but being unable to do so. For Brett, being in love but unable to be with Jake is a torment, and she seeks relief from her inner turmoil through hedonism. For Jake, the situation is similar, but he is more adept at concealing his feelings. On the surface, he appears nonchalant, but only in the stillness of the night does he succumb to feelings of sadness. Deceiving oneself is the most challenging aspect and both the character of Jake in the novel and the author Hemingway himself used this sense of perplexity as a facade. World War I shattered the beliefs of many, whether cultural, religious, or scientific. Having witnessed life turned to ashes and scattered by the wind, it becomes difficult to hold on to any hope or faith in life. Paradoxically, those who were initially optimistic and positive often find it hardest to recover after a breakdown. The greater the hope, the greater the disappointment. It's probably something like that. The next day, as expected, Cohen went to Jake's office again, and this time, the conversation shifted to Brett. Jake informed Cohen that Brett was about to enter her third marriage, just like her previous two marriages where she didn't love her fiancés. These words infuriated Cohen. 
Cohen's anger was peculiar. From the moment he fell in love with Brett, she seemed flawless in his eyes, and he couldn't tolerate even the slightest criticism. In reality, love and virtue are not necessarily related. Cohen's character underwent a significant transformation when he fell in love with Brett. To pursue her, he voluntarily ended his relationship with his lover. It's important to note that in the moral standards of the 1920s Parisian literary circle, there was no inherent connection between pursuing love and maintaining fidelity. In this regard, Cohen was clearly an outlier. That evening, shortly after Jake returned home, Brett arrived, and after a long conversation, she told Jake that they couldn't see each other anymore, marking the end of the first part of the novel. Up to this point in the story, it's evident that among the trio of two men and one woman, Cohen and Jake represent contrasting personalities and values. Brett's character is relatively underdeveloped in the novel. She serves more as a catalyst to highlight the differences between Jake and Cohen. However, in the few detailed descriptions, Hemingway still attempts to help readers understand the inner turmoil and conflicts within Brett, who longs to love but cannot. The second part of the novel begins in June, with Jake and another writer planning to attend the running of the Bulls Festival in Pamplona, Spain, in July. This is the most famous and craziest local festival, taking place from July 6th to the 14th, where every day, six fierce bulls chase hundreds of strong men along the bull run, through the streets, and into the bull ring. It's a thrilling spectacle. After learning about it, Brett also wants to join with her fiancé. It's worth noting that she had recently told Jake that they couldn't see each other anymore, but now she's planning to travel with him, highlighting her inner conflict and contradiction. So, what is Cohen doing at this point? He is vacationing in a border town between France and Spain and, upon hearing about Brett's plans to attend the festival, immediately announces his intention to join the trip. This group of people sets off in two groups. Jake and his writer friend depart from Paris, meet up with Cohen near the border, and then proceed to Pamplona together. Brett and her fiancé decide to go to the Spanish city of San Sebastián first, and then head directly to Pamplona. After Jake's group has settled in Pamplona, they don't receive Brett and Mike as expected. Instead, they receive a telegram saying that the two of them are staying in San Sebastián for the night. Jake deliberately doesn't show the telegram to Cohen because he is jealous of Cohen's ardent pursuit of Brett, envious of Cohen's romantic gestures and flamboyance, things that he himself wishes to do but can't. However, this jealousy is short-lived, and most of the time, Jake can maintain his facade of indifference. With some time to go before the actual running of the Bulls Festival, Jake and his writer friend plan to go fishing in a nearby city, while Cohen remains behind, fully engrossed in waiting for Brett. Brett has replaced everything else in Cohen's life and becomes the sole focus of his existence. Cohen's attitude disgusts Bill, and in fact, throughout the novel, except for his former lover, there's no one who likes Cohen. His stubbornness, romanticism, proactive attitude, and the way he defends his dignity clash with the values of his contemporaries. If Jake and others are the lost generation, then Cohen is clearly a not-so-lost individual within that generation. After nearly a week had passed, Brett and her fiancé arrived late and checked into the hotel. The hotel's owner was well-versed in bullfighting and had personal connections with many accomplished bullfighters. His establishment was a gathering place for bullfighting enthusiasts. The hotel owner took great care of Jake, reserving a room for him every year and securing bullfight tickets, recognizing Jake as a genuine and knowledgeable bullfighting aficionado. As for Jake's friends, the owner could easily see that they were mere spectators, drawn to watch bullfights out of curiosity. One evening, the owner informed Jake that at night, people would place the bulls in the bullring, so Jake took his friends to watch. When the bulls were first placed in the bullring, they were often very irritable. To calm the bulls, two steers were usually placed in with them to absorb the bulls' aggression. These steers were castrated bulls, known for their docile temperament and lack of resistance. After venting their anger on the steers, the bulls would gradually calm down. After watching the bull placement, everyone went to a cafe, and the previous scene had left a deep impression on them. Cohen sympathized with the fate of the steers, feeling that it was too dull being a steer. 
Brett's fiancé, on the other hand, sarcastically referred to Cohen as a steer, suggesting that he was a passive, aimless man who constantly revolved around Brett. However, it was odd for Brett's fiancé to make this remark, considering that he himself was an idler, a heavy drinker, and deeply in debt. The main difference between Cohen and them was that Cohen was not lost. Once he set a goal, he pursued it vigorously. Although this determination was not endearing when it came to romance, the insults he received seemed somewhat excessive. Fortunately, the conflict between them didn't escalate, at least not at that moment. In the following days, everyone coexisted peacefully. Finally, on July 6th, the festival celebrations began. For the first two days, Jake and his friends attended the bullfights daily. During these performances, a bullfighter named Romero captured the attention of all. The novel described Romero's difference from other bullfighters in this way. Romero never made a single extra move. He did not do much. He did not have to. He was, I was sure, a very brave man, and he was never corrupted by the crowd, the money, or the applause. He did not take any foolish chances. As mentioned earlier, Hemingway's writing in the novel strives for conciseness directness, and power, avoiding excessive adjectives, much like his description of Romero's bullfighting technique. In Hemingway's eyes, an excellent bullfighter and an outstanding writer shared similarities in their skills, which is why he was so passionate about bullfighting throughout his life. All the spectators were in awe of Romero's performance, and Brett was particularly taken by him. On the third day, in the hotel restaurant, Jake encountered Romero, who was dining there. He struck up a conversation with him, and soon after, Brett joined their conversation. Jake then invited Romero to sit with Brett and have a couple of drinks. Brett was completely enamored with Romero. Even though Brett spoke French, and Romero spoke Spanish, they conversed ardently. Jake acted as a matchmaker for Brett and Romero, which displeased the hotel owner. Regarding this detail, Hemingway used indirect description, Writing, just then, Montoya, the owner, came in. He was about to smile at me when he saw Romero with a big glass of brandy, sitting between me and a bare-shouldered woman, laughing heartily, and everyone at the table was intoxicated. He didn't even nod. The owner was displeased because he believed Jake, being an expert, should have known that Brett's involvement with Romero in the bullfighting world posed an obstacle. Jake himself, of course, knew that what he was doing wasn't right, but he couldn't refuse Brett's request because it was his last way of expressing his love. For Jake, after experiencing the baptism of war, the meaning of love and even life itself had become questionable. This left him feeling like a rootless wanderer, drifting aimlessly through the real world without finding a stable foothold. His complete compliance with Brett, personally delivering her to another man, and later picking her up again, all demonstrated Jake's inability to love. He didn't know how to face and deal with his own love, so he settled for the next best thing, treating the requests of his beloved as the highest principle. The sadness, heartache, and helplessness that came with this were left for him to ponder in the quiet moments of sleepless nights. Cohen, who also loved Brett, took a different path. He lost his rationality, wanting to run away with Brett and even proposing to her. In Brett's eyes, however, she loved Romero, and her interactions with Cohen were merely a charade. After being rejected so miserably, Cohen redirected his anger towards Romero, using his boxing skills acquired during his college days to violently assault him. Despite Cohen knocking him down multiple times, the young bullfighter refused to stay down. It was only when Cohen felt ashamed of his actions and stopped attacking that Romero, with his last ounce of strength, landed a punch that shattered Cohen psychologically. This time, Cohen couldn't defend his dignity through boxing. He not only failed to win love but also lost the respect of his opponent and others, becoming a failure at the spiritual level. The injured Romero, after being beaten by Cohen, still went on to participate in that day's bullfight as planned. Despite his weakened state, he once again won the audience's acclaim with a spectacular performance and presented Brett with the symbolic trophy, a bull's ear. After the classic festival concluded, Brett followed Romero, and the remaining few people also went their separate ways. However, 
life would go on. The final part of the novel consists of just one short chapter, where Jake, separated from everyone else, arrives in San Sebastian, planning to spend a few days alone. After personally delivering Brett to the others, Jake likely needed some time for solitude, as he had no place to anchor himself in. However, his plans were disrupted by a telegram from Paris that Brett sent him, stating that she was in a difficult situation in Madrid and requesting Jake to come and get her. Upon receiving the telegram, Jake boarded the train bound for Madrid that same night and found Brett at the hotel the next morning. Brett's money was running out, and more importantly, she realized that her relationship with Romero was affecting his bullfighting career. Although Brett had maintained a carefree attitude throughout the novel, when she realized that her relationship with Romero was hindering his career, she made the decision to break free. In fact, Hemingway had subtly foreshadowed this development in earlier descriptions when Jake had been cold-shouldered by the hotel owner due to Brett's involvement with Romero. While these details were only briefly mentioned, they logically provided a basis for the final plot development. Otherwise, Brett's actions would have seemed very abrupt. At the end of the novel, Jake leaves the hotel with Brett, and they take a car ride through Madrid. Brett reflects on how wonderful it would be if she and Jake could be together, and despite her earlier carefree attitude, this moment reveals Brett's true feelings, laden with the countless frustrations of desires unattainable. Only those who have a story to tell can truly understand it. Jake responds by saying, Wouldn't it be pretty to think so? The idea of loving and being together briefly comforts Jake's soul, but he knows that in the real world, he has lost the capacity to love. Love, dignity, and even life itself have lost their original meaning, and life simply continues with its repetitive, mundane routines, much like the sun rising as usual. With the main plot of the novel summarized, We've seen how Hemingway uses concise and powerful language, restrained indirect characterization, and the characteristics and purposes of dialogue in his storytelling. We've also discussed his skill in foreshadowing plot developments. These qualities together constitute Hemingway's unique writing style and narrative technique, often referred to as the iceberg theory. True to its name, the iceberg theory suggests that in Hemingway's novels, what is directly expressed in the text is like the tip of an iceberg, while most of the information, including but not limited to character motivations, emotions, and the author's attitudes, lies hidden beneath the surface of the text, much like the majority of an iceberg submerged underwater. It's up to the readers to interpret and discover this submerged depth on their own. In his later works, Hemingway continued to develop and refine these characteristics, eventually producing his magnum opus, the Old Man and the Sea, in the 1950s. As for the concept of the lost generation, we can't entirely rely on Mrs. Stein's statement. In the novel, some characters are genuinely lost, such as Brett's fiancé, who indulges in drinking and reverie without caring about Brett's affair with Romero. Others, like Jake, are pseudo-lost. His love is obstructed by uncontrollable external forces, and so is his life. Jake's trauma extends beyond the physical. His values and beliefs have been shattered by the war, leaving him in a state of meaningless existence. He perpetually displays an indifferent attitude, sends his beloved with someone else, and then brings her back. Whether they are together or not, the sun continues to rise. It's only in the stillness of the night that he can't control his emotions, revealing his true self. He's not truly lost. He simply disguises himself in this way because he has become too fragile to withstand any more failures. Cohen, on the other hand, has nothing to do with being lost. He's resolute and stubborn, chivalrously pursuing his love, but he only incites others' dislike and ultimately fails to defend his own dignity, becoming a loser. For all the characters in the novel, regardless of their beliefs about the meaning of life or their attitudes, they all ultimately become losers. Nobody attains genuine love, and nobody can escape the shadow of history. The success of The Sun Also Rises can be attributed to Hemingway's literary skills and his accurate portrayal of the mindset of the post-World War I generation. Countless young people, much like Jake, either evade reality or become cynical, choosing confusion out of fear of failure. Even individuals like Cohen, who are outliers and pursue a specific goal with determination, ultimately cannot escape their fate of failure. 
Beyond the novel, we can see that after World War I, Europe underwent a significant transformation in terms of values and culture. The Enlightenment ideals that had been established since the Enlightenment era, based on science and rationality, and the resulting proactive approach to life, were being reconsidered. Writers and intellectuals began to delve into the inner world of individuals and rethink the relationship between the individual and the external world. Similar themes remain relevant today and continue to be a significant driving force behind our reading of literary works. In this interpretation, we've covered several key points. 1. Hemingway's iceberg theory of writing style is evident in The Sun Also Rises, showcasing the effects of concise language, memorable character development, and dialogue representation. 2. While Hemingway later distanced himself from the label of the lost generation, it remains an apt characterization for the novel. However, it's important to delve into the underlying reasons for their sense of loss and consider the broader cultural and intellectual shifts in post-World War I Europe. 3. The primary settings of the story are Paris and Pamplona, and both locations contribute to the novel's atmosphere and natural landscapes. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.